What you're looking at is a Kern CNC mill using its spindle as a rotational axis to scribe or shape some lines into a watch part. This is known as guilloche. I wanted to make a follow-up video to my micro machining with shaping video, and this seemed like the next logical thing to look at. I don't think there's anyone more willing to share what they know about guilloche than my good friend Josh Hacko. And every few months, we generally get together and have a chat. I wake up a little early, he stays up a little late, and sometimes it becomes a podcast called the Precision Microcast, and sometimes it's just us talking. Today, we decided to make a video out of it and share what he knows about guilloche. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, Josh, uh, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Josh Hacko, and I'm the technical director of NH Micro and Nicholas Hacko Watchmaker in Sydney, Australia. Okay, so Josh is here today to tell us about how he's using scribing or shaping in his watchmaking, but also now some commercial projects and how he's doing it on his Kern CNC mills. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's, oh, where do I even start? It's a... It, it's so been a long journey. We've um, we've dabbled with scribing from the watchmaking side for quite a while now. Um, it's not new. This is not something that's been you know discovered by me. Guilloche in watchmaking has been around for a very very long time. You know, it's uh, something that you see on Fabergé eggs, and then you see it on antique clocks from four hundred years ago, and then you see it on things like pens and cigarette cases and more sort of uh, approachably um, watch dials. And um, traditionally, those patterns were made by hand uh, or using sort of cam-driven uh, scribing platforms. They're called Rose engines or straight-line guilloche machines or straight-line engines. And um, there's a lot of, you know, really fascinating craftsmen that are doing this by hand and one of uh one of my interests was always to see how far can you push push guilloche and and you have a few different approaches you can push it on a material standpoint so how interesting of a material can you cut so we like to cut a lot of titanium uh, watch dials are from titanium and a traditional machine is not really rigid enough to give you fantastic um uh like fantastic finishes but when you um, when you transfer the process to a CN modern CNC machine, suddenly you can cut really you know tough materials that would otherwise be I don't want to say impossible, but very challenging, incredibly challenging on a manual platform. Then the other direction that you can push it is what types of patterns can you generate that could not otherwise be generated manually? So we're talking about splines and you know. Uh, patterns that you need CNC or programmable motion to execute. And most of the time, these patterns are generated with a static tool. So this, uh, or actually, you have two categories and within one category, you know, it's a static tool. And that's where we started. We put a static tool in our, in our Kern Pyramid Nano and started, you know, literally scratching away at surfaces. Uh, and yeah. now we move. Hey, stop it. That yeah, machine stop it. <laughs> has, uh, that machine you you mounted the tool via an Aroa pallet to the to the Z axis, right? That's right. That's right. So there's an Aroa chuck that's mounted inside the Z axis of the machine. And uh this was an option uh that so we, we bought that machine secondhand from from a secondhand machinery dealer who purchased it from Rolex. And Rolex specked out that Pyramid Nano with that chuck specifically for guilloche. Uh, so they, they were using this process and we sort of adopted it. Um, and what, what you get is that you bypass the spindle, right? So you, you bypass the spindle interface as a possible point of tilting and deflection. And you also bypass the possibility of damaging the spindle interface. So you don't have to worry about it. Um, which is uh, critical for a very small spindle like an HSK25. For larger spindles, it becomes less of a problem as, as we sort of find out on the, on the micro HD. 
Um, but it also gives you like this huge mass. It's an, incre an incredibly rigid connection. Um, and yeah, so that's that's where we started on that Pyramid Nano with a row amount. All right, and then after that, you you bought your current HD, which um, for those who don't know, it's a similar concept to the Pino, just five axis and kind of optimized around that work envelope. Uh, a little bit smaller, but still has the hydrostatic ways. And this time, instead of the hydrostatic lead screw, it is a linear motor, um, which probably is an improvement for what you're trying to accomplish with the the shaping moves. Um, and so on this machine, you don't have the Aroa mount. You're holding the holder directly in the spindle. Uh, That's right. That's right. So we're putting like what's equivalently like a stick to it like a lathe tool in the spindle and sharpening the carbide on the tip of the tool to the geometry that we want. And originally we just transferred the process. So we didn't involve any spindle rotation. We just had, you know, the, the tool in the spindle and we used it in the same, uh, same sort of fashion where we're just scribing in a straight line. And now I say straight line, we're not making straight lines. You still have an X, shift along your y movement so your y and your x are both moving you can even add z movement as well although that gets a bit complex and for a few other reasons like your tool geometry gets a bit, bit crazy um but uh that was the start of 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 using the micro hd as a scribing platform and you get a couple of benefits like you've mentioned you you get this like more modern machine kinematic layout and slightly more precise machine but you also get the ability to tool change the tool out. And you can use it as a milling platform for 99% of the, of the part and then spindle, you know, uh, tool change in a uh, tool into the spindle for scribing. Um, also with the way that, I mean, there's like a really minor improvement, but like in the way that, how the Pyramid Nano is set up, you can't touch off your scribing tool with a laser. You have to touch it off manually with like some paper or you know, increment it down until you start cutting. Uh, whereas on the HD, because it's all in the spindle, you just use the laser to find the tip of the tool. And that's a huge productivity improvement. Um, so that all leads, you know, to like uh, spending less time screwing around with a machine and more time uh, either pursuing decorative patterns or enabling this technology to be utilized by industrial applications. Um, cause if you have to charge like an exuberant setup cost, every time you set up, a, you know, this tool, um, industry doesn't like that. It doesn't jive. Um, so yeah. All right. What are you using for cutting materials? I know you're using lap carbide, but you also experiment with diamond, don't you? That's right. So generally we, I'd say about 80% of the time we're using carbide that we grind and lap to the forms that we want. Um, and then we've recently also started using polycrystalline and monocrystalline diamond, which is great. That it works incredibly well, uh, for cutting non-ferrous materials, especially on a surface finish level, but with PCD, you get incredible tool life in, in titanium as well. But you get one downside, which is that with carbide, well, sorry, with diamond, you, it's very difficult to relap. Obviously, it's possible to relap, but you have to send it out for relapping. And that means that you have to, you know, these are expensive tools. They're like uh, five, $600 a tool um, or more. And if you don't have access to the tool while it's being relapped, you generally want a sister tool of the same type. And so then you have two five or $600 tools. Um, and... Yeah, the relapping cost is actually really economical. It, it might be a fraction of the tool cost for the for the tool manufacturer just to touch these edges up, but it takes time. So the way what well, what we currently have as a trade off is that we use carbide, and that sort of doesn't give us this this incredible surface quality, but we can maintain a maintain a very very keen edge because we can constantly be relapping this this edge in-house in carbide, but in PCD and MCD, that's a lot more challenging. Okay. So now the machine had all the hardware necessary 
on it to do what you need to do with the C-axis prime rotation, but it wasn't quite optimized, was it? It's meant mainly to orient the tool for tool changing and probing. Um, what all was involved in getting the machine to actually rotate the spindle as a programmable axis? That's a very good question. Um, so fundamentally, most machine tools have the ability to orient the spindle. That's sort of standard feature for, as you've said, tool changes or things like probing where you have to, you know, rotate the probe in like the bloom cycles to present the ruby in the same direction. But on a, on a fundamental level, the spindle is still acting the same way as if it was a turning spindle, like a free turning spindle. Um, a free turning spindle like what we're used to seeing in, in vertical machining centers or lathes is designed to get to the, the final cutting speed as quickly as possible. <laughs> like you don't want to press spindle start and wait, you know, a minute for it to ramp up to spindle speed. You want it to get there as quickly as possible and start cutting. And while you're up there, you want the maximum amount of torque. So when, when this, like this is all on the servo parameter side and on the control side. So when you, Orient the spindle with an M19 in, in Heidenheim. You, um, what you're doing is you're supplying the full amperage to the spindle, to the spindle motor to turn it, you know, like 90 degrees. And you get like 15 amps into the spindle and it goes bang. Or, as, well, it doesn't go bang, but like it goes as quickly as possible. And what, what we call that is, is the jerk, which is the acceleration of the acceleration. It's the, it's how quickly you're accelerating. <laughs> and um, your jerk is often sent to, set to like the maximum limit. And then we start talking about like things like PID loops. And so what's the encoder feedback telling, telling the control? Um, and how does that control feedback loop get optimized? Um, directly impacts your surface finish on the part when you're doing scribing. So if you just have the spindle, you know, snapping from angle to angle while you're moving, even if it's not like an inverse time relationship, but like a, if, it's, if it's just too jerky, you'll see that in your finish as some form of like an artifact. It looks sort of like chatter, more like faceting of, but it, it's just not appealing to your eye, especially when you move to monocrystalline tools, it shows up. It actually looks worse. And if you were to use something like carbide. And so on the machine side, what you have to do is you have to like trick the machine into thinking that a spindle is actually a C axis or a C prime axis or any, you know, letter designation. And uh, it should then act more like a rotary axis. And you have to reassign all the servo parameters to basically say, uh, we don't want this thing to snap to place. We want it to like move smoothly. And then you have this interplay between a rotary axis that's not really supposed to be a rotary axis and your linear moves and how the control manages its acceleration of the linear axes at the tangent points when you're like moving straight and then you start turning. Like, does it move straight, stop, and then start turning and then stop? Does it move straight, start to deaccelerate, -acceler de accelerate, and then move? Does it like how smooth is that transition? All of that needs to be tuned and tuned and tuned um, to give you really like stellar results. Um, so, like on U UP machines, uh, they spend a lot of time doing this because their spindles act like that more often than they don't or have the capacity to do that. But on a milling machine, even a kern, it's designed to cut chips by rotating the spindle, not by, you know, keeping it steady. All right. Well, we'll close up on that note. Uh, cutting chips via rotation, like how annoying is it? Uh, like, what do you get from what do you get from static tooling uh, that that you struggle with with uh, small micro end mills? That's uh, yeah. Again, fantastic question, um, and it's probably something that I get asked all like the most. It's like, what's the point? Like, why are you chamfering like that? It, it would be so much quicker to chamfer with you know rotating tool. And yeah, it, it would be, but we're talking about different requirements. We're like talking about surface finish. And the one big thing that you gain with a static tool that's following a contour rather than a rotating tool that's taking a chip is that you don't have feed forward lines. You have a constant chip 
It's an unbroken chip that's getting formed. And so your only artifacts are your machine motion and the cutting edge sharpness or the form of the cutting edge. Whereas if you have a chamfer tool, you get the cutting edge form and sharpness, the machine tool motion, but also your spindle sort of incrementing forward every time the tool rotates. Uh, so when you reduce one of those factors, you suddenly get a much, much higher quality surface. So that's one thing. And the second thing is more on the industrial side. You can generate forms that are not possible to generate with rotating tools. So if you think about things like really small grooves um, or very, very um, or <laughs> uh, like linear turning, you know, if that makes sense, like linear grooving or linear turning tool paths, it, that's probably the best way to describe it. It suddenly becomes possible. And then moreover than that, like one application I'm really excited about is micro chamfering. So if you want to put like a 5, 10 micron chamfer on, a, on, a, on, a, on an edge just to break it, um, by turning the spindle off, you eliminate, you know, distortion through heat. Uh, so you have really good Z control. And then your cutting condition is really, really nice. If you take a 5 to 10 micron chip, over time that tool wears. But if you scribe a 5 to 10 micron chip, that tool will last an incredibly long time. All right. Well, thank you for, for sharing all this. I know your industry typically is very guarded with some of the, the secrets of how you guys make watches. Um, and I know you're not the first person on the block to do this sort of thing but you are the first to talk about it. And I, I think that's important, um, or at least I appreciate it. Uh, Thanks, Adam. So. That's very kind. <laughs>